गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन एट द आउट सेट आई एम एक्सट्रीमली थैंकफुल टू पी एस जी ऑर्गेनाइजिंग कमेटी डॉक्टर उतुल डॉक्टर बंसी एंड अदर पीपल फॉर दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी आई बिन आस्ट टू स्पीक ऑन आइडियल ग्लाइसेमिक मार्कर्स इन एच आई पी आई थिंक ए डिबेट ऑन थेरेपी इज ऑलरेडी ओवर वी हैड ए लॉन्ग डिस्कशन ऑन वेदर टू गिव मेटफॉर्म इन और इंसुलिन एंड डॉक्टर मनोज चावला अगेन सेट इन द स्टेज फॉर रेगुलर मॉनिटरिंग विद ए जी पी और विद सी जी एम एस सो लेट मी टेक यू थ्रू वॉट विल बी एन आइडियल वे ऑफ मॉनिटरिंग ग्लाइसिमिक कंट्रोल इन जी डी एम और इन डी आई पी और हाइपर ग्लाइसीमिया इन प्रेगनेंसी वी ऑल नो हाइपर ग्लाइसीमिया इज़ वन ऑफ द मोस्ट कॉमन मेडिकल कंडीशन विच ए वूमेन कैन एनकाउंटर ड्यूरिंग प्रेगनेंसी एंड ऑलमोस्ट वन वन इन सिक्स लाइफ बर्थ्स आर डेफिनेटली लाइकली टू हैव सम डिग्री ऑफ डिस ग्लाइसीमिया एंड एटी फोर परसेंट ऑफ दैट एक्चुअली हैपन्स टू बी जिस्टेशनल डायबिटीज देर इज़ ए वेरी टाइट नीड very uh, uh, important need for strict glycemic control for the mother and for the fetus so as to avoid certain fetal growth and macrosomia and also to cut down on neonatal and maternal risk of complication if you can ensure a very tight glycemic control because we know all offsprings born out of hyperglycemia in pregnancy are the one who are likely to develop ncds subsequently greater risk of metabolic syndrome obesity or cardiovascular disease so here is a wonderful study hepo which has been sort of benchmark or a landmark data on incidence of adverse outcomes along continuum this was the first study which said that there is no threshold or At a, at a level where no complication will happen, so it is something like a continuum of glycemia, and you could see that if you monitor these patients in terms of their weight gain, need for primary cesarean section, clinical neonatal hyperglycemia, or cord blood C peptide level over the 90th percentile, it is a continuum of hyperglycemia which is going to do lot of damage. So we must ensure a U glycemia in pregnancy so as to cut down on. all these uh, markers of derangement no, neither to the mother but also to the neonates also the glycemic targets i'll be talking only about dipsy are very very absolutely clear it has to be a fasting as close to 90 as possible and a post meal to our sugar not more than 120 mg so let's see what are going to be the glycemic control indicators self monitoring of blood glucose we have already discussed need for cgm dr manoj chavla alluded to it very nicely need for using agp hv1c which is already in controversy whether there is any role of glycated albumin fructosamine or 15 and hydroglucitol so i'll just take you through quickly best ways of course smbg and it is uh, possibly in most of our patient the way to achieve good glycemic control the optimum frequency for smbg is still not uh, the final word is not out but all those who are on medical nutrition therapy simply diet and all that they can be monitored maybe once or twice a day but those patient those who are already on insulin there we require much much uh, frequent monitoring it could be up to 3 to 4 times or up to 6 to 7 time that means all pre meals post meals and maybe a bed time or once in a while 2 am sugar also and there is going to be a superiority of daily self monitoring of blood glucose as compared to intermittent done on clinical basis obviously because that will not serve the purpose when we are talking of using agp in an attempt to get you glycemia at least we must ensure at least 4 to 6 times of smbg on daily basis and obstetrics uh, college of american uh, obstetrics and gynecology published four times daily glucose monitoring as advocated and those patient those who are already on insulin therapy it could be much more i told you maybe six to seven times is must again there is a debate whether to do it two hours one hour postprandial but well as per this data they say that 60 to 90 minutes probably will be having better outcomes in terms of getting good glycemic control again frequency of smbg i told you if it is type 1 was conceived it has to be minimum 6 times because there of course you cannot achieve you cannot have a sugar as close to 63 to 140 until unless you do 6 to 7 times a day and the glycemic goal will be even more difficult to achieve in type 1 bansi very rightly said many gynecologists may be afraid that if type 1 conceived probably outcomes will not be good enough and then always there is a risk of hypoglycemia so 6 to 7 times possibly can make some difference but most important thing is it has to be a 
meaningful monitoring with smbg don't use it as a simply as a tool make your patient value their smbg you must educate them how to read these smbg value so that next time they come you also spend some time with them and make this smbg record of last two weeks very very meaningful a historical background first cgm was used as early as 1999 it was minimed cgm system then gluco watch in 2001 jdrf continuous glucose monitoring study group said that it could be wonderful if you do a cgm in every type 1 patient who conceives and of course studies on cgm in diabetes in pregnancy are there now a lot of evidence is there even with cgm or with agp and now fortunately you have even fda approved devices also this is how a cgm works the sensor consists of a thin 1 cm long flexible polyurethane tube that houses the glucose sensing electrode the sensor measures that interstitial glucose it is not a venous glucose it is an interstitial glucose which gets converted to a electric potential you may say spike and the sensor signal is required every 10 seconds but then of course the reports are generated every 5 minutes so it comes out to be roughly 288 readings in almost 24 hours time well because you are sensing only the interstitial glucose so obviously there is going to be a physiological lag of about 5 to 10 minutes if you do it with a venous sugar or and uh, of course the problem is that these uh, need to be calibrated so that is one issue with them and more important is not to go only on the values but to look for the trends which are going to be extremely important before you interpret because i told you there could be 5 to 10 minutes or 15 minute lag also so there these are good for better detection of hyperglycemia as well as hypoglycemic episodes but then versus cgm professional versus a personal cgm a personal one is which gives you a real time glucose results which is definitely much better than a professional one because there you have a blinding only and it has to be read either in your clinic or it has to be interpreted by one of the healthcare providers and it does not get you alerts of hypo as well as hyperglycemia with a personal cgm which gets you a real time value there are alarms for highs and lows so obviously control comes out to be much better and as compared to smbg well cgm used in pregnancy lot of studies are already published and all these studies have concluded i'll not be going into the details that professional cgm to evaluate previously unknown hyperglycemia manoj was rightly saying that even if you are doing 3 point or 4 point or 6 point or 7 points even then you are likely to miss those late uh, meal hyperglycemia which are there especially in type 1 and these studies have actually identified that if you are not doing a cgm simultaneously and going only with smbg maybe you might miss almost 94 minutes to 390 minutes of undetected hyperglycemia which may make huge difference what professor shishai very rightly said that earlier days when we didn't have those devices we were saying that those icd uh, iods or something has happened possibly there was some amount of glycemic variability which we were not able to pick up now fortunately with these us fda approved devices it is possible to pick up these excursion and immediately intervene especially if you are using a real time cgm and women spent a mean of almost 5.5 hours per day in previously unrecognized hyperglycemia and this is again a very good study although very small data of 10 women with gestational diabetes and these elevation of blood glucose often occurred shortly after patient took fasting and postprandial so even if you are doing all pre meal this is what i was saying and do you all post meals maybe 6 to 7 values still many excursion you will miss which you might be able to pick up with cgm and it is a actually an uh, Uh, uh short data but they these patient they have enrolled some asian patients so it was very very close to our ethnicity similarly this patient regularly perform four finger pricks per day fasting and one hour after each meal which most of us we say if you are not able to do six or seven at least one fasting and one post meal after every meal all finger sticks are at or below 120 but cgm reveals that daily time spent was much above the level so still time above the range is much higher which can only be picked up by cgm and that you might still miss if you are doing only smbg 
again a wonderful article talking about evaluation of metabolic control in women with gestational diabetes by continuous glucose monitoring it's it was a pilot study and it again concluded that cgm detected long asymptomatic periods of high as well as low many nocturnal hypoglycemia if it is happening especially 3 to 4 hours post dinner you are likely to miss if you are doing only a 2 hours post dinner with simple smbg so cgm versus smbg i think these are complementary to each other not every patient will be able to adhere to agm agp or cgm or will be able to afford it and you may not have very good uh, hcps to interpret that cgm or agp uh, graphs also so these are more like complementary to each other but these have to be performed very very meticulously because these are going to reflect patient blood glucose levels and once you compare with smbg cgms could detect post prandial i told you and nocturnal hypos which you might miss if you are not using cgm in these patient another study got published in diabetes research and clinical practice cgm in gdm among mothers with gestational diabetes in those allocated to monitor glucose with cgms anti hyperglycemic medication has been started in a much higher proportion that means you are immediately acting so if you are going only with smbg it is likely that you may not go for an intensive control because you may miss those postprandial excursions so if you are using a cgm or agp like device many a times you will uh, like to a patient is on say metformin you might like to add insulin patient is already on insulin you might up titrate the doses for getting a good glycemic control another publication in dtt a continuous glucose monitoring in type 1 pregnancy shows that fetal heart rate correlates with maternal glycemia every excursion might increase fetal heart rate so if you are doing a cgm probably you will be able uh, you might be able to pick it up and uh, up titrate the doses to prevent those excursion and to ensure a very tight glycemic control as 2016 said that benefits of cgm in pregnant female with pre existing diabetes are still unclear i think it is 7 years old data now we have the recommendation that even there also cgm or egp could do wonders in terms of manoj has already shown you one publication that versus uh, a conventional control or without cgm there is going to be huge difference so today possibly in addition to smbg it can supplement and can ensure a very very tight glycemic control and larger studies are obviously needed to find out the effect of real time cgm on pregnancy much more important we need prospective data to make sure that there are going to be differences in terms of not only maternal outcome but fetal outcomes also and future roles of cgm could be in these patient not only for identifying gdm for using cgm for treatment assessment cgm as an effective treatment modifier also to be on intensive insulin therapy and to make sure that we have more improved pregnancy outcomes also and this manoj has already covered but i'll just be quickly going through it agp for measuring that uh glycemic excursion and variability it provides a new approach to evaluation of glycemic control it is we all know it is represented by three time series 25th 50th and 75th percentile glucose values and these metrics are now available lot of studies are there the targets in pregnancy and especially in type 1 and agp can potentially be used in practice for not only for management of individual index pregnancy but also for development refinement and testing new algorithms so that when you come out with new guidelines you may make sure that how uh, intensive control can make differences and this is uh, again a uh, few case studies you could see that in this study most of the time this female is uh, time above target almost 70 to 80 percent times and control is very very poor another patient who has a very seemingly very good control but possibly it is on the cost of many episodes of hypoglycemia but i agree manoj rightly said in pregnancy you need to be very very cautious interpreting agp giving you hypoglycemia because even if uh, when you are talking about 64 mg in agp that may come out to be something like hypoglycemia and whenever sugar is going less than 70 it tends to be little more erroneous with agp so there you need to possibly complement 
with SMBG because then it may be much more accurate. So EGP glycemic variability pattern of another patient uh, of GDM at 21 to 24 weeks, something like an ideal, very, very thin ribbon type. You could see that almost all the values are within the target range and time above range is very, very less. Even time below range in uh, first on 8th and 9th February is there, but moment you down titrate the doses even that hypoglycemia has disappeared another important way of looking into glycemic control hv1c and whether it will have any relation to ship to the uh, birth weight this is from doc shithai's very old book hv1c is not suitable for screening for gestational diabetes since it yields high false positive and false negative quite significant number so he said that a1c estimation is useful in pre-gestational diabetes to look into the retrospective blood glucose control if it was more than six in first trimester possibly it was a missed uh, type one or type two most likely type two and it could be a pre-existing diabetes and in early trimester more than six indicates definitely poor control because these days we are talking about something like 5.3 but in any case it is a useful tool for monitoring the control during pregnancy of course it will not help in day-to-day -day management there you will have to rely on smbg or maybe on agp or cgms and there are uh, caveats if you are going with only hv1c because there is an increase in plasma volume a stage of hemolysis is there a physiological anemia is there increase in erythropoietin levels are there so formation of hv1c is irreversible and value depends on rbc lifespan shorter is the span because of some hemolysis obviously it will give you a false low value another important thing is we all know that when we are interpreting hv1c it gets you 50 percent com control which is being reflected for last 30 days and remaining 25 percent and 25 percent for last two months so that again needs to be taken into account so it may not be immediately of any help and any situation which shorten the erythrocyte survival obviously will lead on to falsely low hv1c iron deficiency anemia in indian patient it is very very relevant will increase hv1c so moment you corrected maybe hv1c will get you a low value so again there are going to be some errors if you are going only with hv1c ethnic variations are there it has been seen in various studies that Asian versus Caucasian HV1C is almost higher by 0.3% in Asian patients versus Caucasian. So that also we need to look into. And then HV1C levels are significantly lower in early and in late pregnancy. Early pregnancy because mean sugar may be fasting only close to 74 and post meal never exceeds 110. It is actually 99 plus minus 10. So their HV1C may be on the lower side. So again, we actually should have pregnancies. Uh, trimester specific HV1C but unfortunately we don't have many studies on that which have looked into individual trimester levels of HV1C because if you are interpreting with simple HV1C report without looking into whether it is first trimester, second trimester or third trimester again you, you may do an error. Most of these studies are not from Asian patients so whether these are going to be relevant to us or no. Very early study by Dr. Balaji Professor Sheshai group looked into HV1C in gestational diabetes in Asian Indian women and this was designed to find out whether estimation of HV1C along with an oral glucose tolerance test would help us to distinguish between pre-GDM and GDM what I was uh, talking about when Dr. Sunil was talking 507 patient and he said that if it is clearly less than 5.3 very early data almost 15 years ago if it is less than 5.3 this is absolutely normal there is no pre-existing diabetes if your levels are between 120 to 140 and hv1c is between 5.3 to 6 you need to be very very cautious and monitor these patients very very closely if it is clearly more than six percent and value more than 140 on oral glucose tolerance test possibly this patient has GDM and during normal pregnancy HV1C was 5.3 as per his data of almost 507 patient and as I already said if it was more than 6 clearly patient has GDM. So from this data it was concluded that HV1C is lower in all three trimesters of normal pregnancy as compared to the non-pregnant state and we must impose stricter upper limits for HV1C when monitoring glycemic control in pregnant 
and diabetic subjects hvac level in different trimesters again may correlate with the birth weight so again that also needs to be established with more prospective data so as to prevent macrosomia and lower hvac than internationally acceptable level i told you indian patient have 0.3 which is on the higher side as compared to the caucasian patient the scope for a future research is that trimester wise specific hvnc we should look into another measure could be a fructose mean which gives you values almost 2 to 3 weeks prior to when you are looking into that it can be very very useful but unfortunately we don't have very very standardized assay as now we have for hvnc a single fructose mean test compared to hvnc has given a sensitivity of almost 87% and specificity close to 94.5 so again you might do an smbg you might do an hvnc not for uh, using it in uh, practice for titration simultaneously if you are doing fructose mean maybe you might have a much higher specificity and sensitivity the use of serum fructose mean for screening was gdm again it has been used and again it is said that glycosylated protein and fructose mean widely are available but as i said these are still not very well standardized in our own population so versus hv1c if you are using a glycated albumin uh, uh again it can be of some use these are the time courses of indicators of glycemic control in normal pregnant women you could see hv1c versus Uh, glycated albumin hv1c i told you it goes up in between in the second trimester and then there is again a little dip glycated albumin that way is much more stagnant value much more consistent value and it if it can be interpreted and compared versus a casual plasma glucose it may again come out come out to be very very handy these are again time courses of hemoglobin a1c and glycated albumin in pregnant that was in non pregnant female with diabetes and patient with gestational diabetes again you could see versus hv1c possibly glycated albumin is again much more sensitive and may, might get you even more consistent results as compared to hv1c again you don't have many studies from our own country uh, in terms of standardization of glycated albumin but if you compare it versus hv1c glycated albumin during pregnancy the incidence of neonatal complication if hv1c is more than 5.8 if more than 5.8 obviously the risk for all neonatal complications goes up and similarly you can compare it versus glycated albumin also which gets you much better results and could predict neonatal complication if your glycated albumin has been more than 15.8% so to conclude hv1c overestimates glycemic control due to iron deficiency in pregnant moment you correct iron deficiency it may go down so it is said that a glycated albumin could be a better index of glycemic control and in the last a word about low 15 and hydroglycerol levels which are which have been linked to various risk of complication more so angio angiopathy microangiopathy in type 2 diabetes you can predict onset of retinopathy and progression and nephropathy in type 2 diabetes if you are regularly looking into uh, 15 ag levels but in pregnancy also it has been found to be a very good indicator because if you have uh, you try to correlate it with neonatal birth weight across all trimester in pregnancy complicated to diabetes you will say that association with 15 ag versus uh, newborn weight z score during pregnancy may be explained by hyperglycemia so there also it can be a very very good tool to monitor sugar and it has a very promising adjunct role in management of pregnancy complicated by diabetes so not only microangiopathy in type 2 diabetes in pregnancy also it can be a useful tool but again not many labs are doing it and it is quite expensive i think only two or three standard labs are doing it so if you want to see the comparison of hv1c fructose mean versus 15g hv1c will tell you something what has happened at least 50% in last 30 days and remaining 25 25% of last 2 months fructose mean might get you more recent uh, control of last 2 weeks but 15 ag is very very sensitive it tells you what has happened over last 5 to 7 days so it gets you much quicker change which is sharp and it can be analyzed much better so this could be a future tool for monitoring of sugars thank you very much your patience listening and if you have any questions
I'll be more than happy to answer that.